Okay, it's time for our fourth lesson, I believe, on the topic of gender and church. And we're going to be looking at the Bible kind of one piece at a time, moving through it as you'd find it in your Bible. Just open up, we'll start in Genesis and make our way through till we get to the end and asking questions about gender. Uh, you may remember last week we talked about two distinct points of views that we're going to emphasize and compare and contrast throughout this study. First is complementarian and the other is egalitarian. A complementarian is going to state that the genders are equal, but that they have different roles in the function or hierarchy that God has established for them. Uh, egalitarian is going to say, if you have a hierarchy, you don't have equality, and so we're going to have to change the way we do that. Uh, special thanks. I'm going to make a nod in this direction because I always like to tell when, on myself when I just blatantly steal someone's outline. Um, uh, special thanks to Dr. John Mark Hicks, who puts together a, a set of notes that I uh, took and cannibalized to my own purposes, as I'm prone to do. Um, Dr. Hicks is out at uh, Lipscomb University right now, and uh, is just a really nice guy, to be honest with you. Um, he puts that material out for free, and he's one of the few people I've known in Churches of Christ who have written a book on both sides of this issue. Like, early in his career, he took one point of view, and later in his career, he took a different point of view. And uh, as such, he has a really good grasp, I think, of what both sides say. So in his material, he does what we're going to do. He compares the differing schools of thought and then kind of leads you through that and lets you read the text and, and try to understand that. So I found that really helpful, even though, again, Dr. Hicks and I don't always agree ourselves. I found his notes to be useful, and he has a lot of that available in a couple of books on the subject, one of which is on my shelf. Uh, we're going to start in the creation, because that seems like a good place to start, and start reading the Bible and asking what is it teaching us about the topic of men and women, uh, of gender, and how they function together. Genesis 1.27, some of this, by the way, will be a repeat of the initial lesson where we said, what is gender? We spent a lot of time in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, we're going to do a little more of that today, uh, but hopefully with more detail. Uh, Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So notice the way that's worded. Um, humanity, here's some things that both, both schools of thought agree on. Humanity is both male and female. Okay, it's not humans and non-humans. Both male and female are human and share that equal and common humanity. No question about that. Male and female have a shared identity in the sense that they image God. They are like God. Uh, I say image as a verb there in the sense that it, they express or reflect the image of God. That is their task. If a man or woman doesn't show the image of God in their life, then they're not being very good men and women. Like That is who they're supposed to be. And male and female have a shared task. If you go back and read that verse, uh, he has a purpose for them. If you read chapter 1 and chapter 2, they have a task that they're going to share in being fruitful and multiplying and cultivating and stewarding the creation and all these things. All of that's going on in God's work that they're going to share. Both schools of thought pretty well agree on everything on the screen, no question. Uh, and then the, then the distinctions start. Uh, an egalitarian is going to read that text and say, huh, interesting, there is no hint of distinction except the difference between male and female. I mean, it just, yeah, there is male and female, but other than just mentioning they are male and female, there's no distinction in the fact that they are both image-bearing creatures. Everything is shared in this account, in this verse. Their identity, both humans and the image of God, and task to bear the image of God and steward the creation. There are no differentiations in this text of their role. So an egalitarian is going to say, see, like we told you, it seems like there's a great deal of equality here, and that's what we should be stressing in the relationship of men and women. Complementarian would say, uh, I see something different. I notice that from the outset, there is already diversity in creation, whether it's heaven and earth above and below, or male and female, that there are distinctions made in the creation of the world. And while those they have a shared task and identity, uh, it's certainly possible that with that distinction in place, they have a diverse role within that task and identity. Um, and you see that right up front, a complementarian would say, um, because the most obvious distinction is the role they play in procreation. Be fruitful and multiply, right? Simple version of that says, have kids, okay? That was Adam and Eve's you know, big job right up front. Uh, we're going to have to have some more humans, 
men and women don't share the same role biologically in making children. I hopefully don't have to explain that in any further detail. Uh, so a complementarian would say, you know, it's obvious that, in the same way, it's kind of fascinating to me, in the same way an egalitarian would say, it's obvious that they are fundamentally equal in this verse, and that's the point. The complementarian says, it's obvious that we're being shown how different they are, and that they have different functions, even though they share their humanity. Uh, Genesis 2, 18 through 23, uh, this is, again, that second uh, extended edition of the creation account in chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field for Adam. Uh, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, uh, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay. What things we pretty much agree on in that text? Um, First of all, man is not designed for solitude. It's not, not to say you can't exist that way, it's just not best. Um, we're created for community with one who shares identity with us. Okay? Uh, the woman, unlike the animals, uh, just remember here, this, I don't think this story is trying to tell us that God wasn't sure whether we might find an animal that might work or not. I think it was from human's benefit, from Adam's benefit. You need to know that you need someone. And it's not going to be any of these creatures. And so to make that point, they parade the animals in front. He's like, yeah, that's going to work. I don't find any community with the cows and the sheep and the birds. Uh, and so instead, it's woman who is the helper fit for him or the helper partner for him. Literally, uh, the helper corresponding to him. Uh, in this text, both complementarian and egalitarian typically agree she's created as a companion and not a slave. He's not given a subservient being, again, like the ox of the field might have been, this is a co-worker, a co-laborer, someone who's going to share in the work of humanity with you. Um, and it's in, in this, the solitary man finds oneness and completeness in relation to the woman. The narrative moves from human incompleteness to human completeness because men and women exist together. So pretty much everybody from both points of view are going to agree on that much. An egalitarian is going to say, well, uh, we need to stress that the text focuses on mutuality rather than hierarchy or role dif differentiation. Humanity is complete as male and female. Humanity finds oneness in relationship with each other as male and female in marriage, but also just as humans, male and females, uh, as sing singles in a community that we're just better off together. Uh, males and females are meant to exist. And there's no inherent hierarchy or role differentiation in this text in chapter 2. Complementarian would respond, eh, uh, we're also going to stress mutuality, they'll say. But in addition, uh, they would say they believe that the principle of primogeniture comes into play because man was created first. In other words, if God had wanted them to be perfectly, identically equal from the outset, he could have made them both at the same time. But in making one before the other, he seems to be making a statement. And in the same way, ancient cultures, and even modern cultures, really, uh, understand the, the oldest brother to be kind of the first among equals. The firstborn has some legal rights. Uh, and charged with primary responsibility, the oldest has more responsibility than younger children. Um, so the man in this text is made first, and is accordingly the head of a woman in a similar way. That there is an implicit hierarchy because one is made before the other. Uh, so that's the complementarian perspective on that. This, I'm skipping ahead a bit. I told you I'd stay in creation, and now I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians. But it's important because that terminology finds its way into the very difficult chapter of 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 12. Paul says, I want you to understand, and by, this is, okay, give some background. This is a discussion about women wearing veils or not wearing veils that we're going to have to talk about again when we get to 1 Corinthians later in a different lesson. But for now, let's read along. 
I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the wife is her husband, the head of Christ is God. A man is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for, for woman, but woman for man. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made for man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. So you can see there in that text, Paul is definitely referencing back to the creation account we just read about who was made first. Was woman made for the man or man for the woman? And he makes a point about that. When a complementarian reads that, he says, see, that's what we said. Headship is rooted in creation. There is an honor relationship that is grounded in the fact that woman was created from and for man. Uh, and they'll also refer you to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 as saying something of the same thing. We're going to come to that passage when we get to 1 Timothy, but not today. Uh, the meaning of headship in this does not su imply superiority, but relates to function and role. It doesn't mean that men are better than women, but in terms of function and role, uh, men have a different status or relationship in the hierarchy. Men are given leadership in family and church. That is, they are accountable, responsible, and should take the initiative, would be the, the complementary interpretation of that text. An egalitarian would say not so fast. Headship relates to origin rather than function. Women honor men because they were created for men, just as Christ finds his origin in God and thus honors God. And egalitarians would emphasize that in verses 11 and 12, it reemphasizes there that today men come from women, right? In the beginning, woman was taken from the side of a man, but today we are born of woman. And so what they would say is Paul is acknowledging that er earlier inequality and kind of saying, yeah, but get on board, fellas. Now we recognize that there is this back and forth between men and women that is the only way humanity exists. Women should honor men because they were created first, but men should honor women because they came through women, right? There's not any of us going to be here without mothers. And so the egalitarian perspective says, I think you're just misreading the point Paul's making and that he's actually balancing the honor, not trying to say that the firstborn uh, Adam uh, has greater honor. Okay, so that's our short discussion. I know that was not a whole lot going on there in those texts because we had already talked about Genesis. I also want to give you, as this is a discussion-oriented video, uh, some time to talk about the Genesis account and the meaning of it because it does play such a large role in further discussions. Next week, we're going to get to the fall passages, Genesis chapter 3, if you want to be reading ahead, and how uh, that plays into the story of gender in the church. Thank you.